is uh, my alarm about the podcast. <laughs> it's good to hear your voice, by the way. I, I realize in the pandemic time when I'm, I'm connected to people, I never know what they sound like so often unless we're on a Zoom meeting or they recorded something and posted it. Yeah, I, uh, well, you know, that was a thing. I, I, um, I've been wanting to start a podcast for years and I had tried to do it off and on. But initially, the infrastructure wasn't really in place. You know, I'm, I'm more of a services guy. If the service is there, I'll use it. But I'm mm-hmm. not going to go in and build a server and create an algorithm to host my podcast. Like YouTube started, I started using YouTube. And then as soon as the service anchor started, I'm like, okay, now it's time for me to do my podcast. <laughs> They're basically okay. the, YouTube, the YouTube of uh, podcasting. And it, it sort of uh, kept me from going insane during the pandemic, because if there's one thing I love, it's talking to creative people about, how, you know, how productive they're being or not being and why and what their process looks like. It's the only reason I live in New York City uh, is because of all the film festivals and the art gallery openings and the, the poetry readings. Uh, there's always an opportunity to have these conversations and but except for this year, <laughs> it's been completely just shut down. Well, I've got a little New York over my shoulder. Um, I haven't hung it up yet. I just dug it out this, what, over the weekend. Uh, it's a Subway Series poster that when I was in New York for the Subway Series and I was staying with a friend in Queens, I went by this this shop and there was a giant poster in the window. I mean, like full, like full size, like six foot tall, like this huge poster. And I went inside, and I said to the guy, hey, I want that. He's like, you and everyone else in New York. He said, but I'll make you one. I'll cut to make you one. So he made me one, and he sent it off to me. And I was living in, in Houston at the time. And uh, I just dug it out a few days ago because I've been thinking about New York a lot lately. And I'm like, i got to hang this thing back up. So it's sitting against my wall right now. You're in, uh, you're in Texas? Yeah, San Antonio. Okay. How would you fare over the past couple of weeks? Very rough. Um but we're not equipped for it. You know, we lost power for almost a week. We lost internet for longer. Um, we struggled to get wood. There was like no wood anywhere. We have a fireplace. So, you know, we were burning cardboard and, you know, got wood luckily from somebody, some caring soul. And, uh, luckily they didn't run out of water. Um, a lot of people like had pipes that burst and, you know, water damage. We didn't have anything like that, but, um, uh, it was tough. You know, I'm a Northern kid. I mean, I grew up in upstate New York, so, you know, I feel like I should have been prepared, but it's hard to prepare in a place that there's not the supplies and resources you know, available for it. Yeah, well, I mean, upstate New York, I mean, they, they insulate the pipes. They they buy pipes that can be frozen if they need to, you know, if inevitably they will be frozen. Yeah. And um, the whole infrastructure is, is, it assumes that there will be a cold spell at some point. Whereas in a warm climate, nobody really thinking about that stuff. No, it even, it even rebounded the temperatures in the 70s and 80s after that. So it's just, it's the most surreal winter. Yeah, th- those photos too of like the icicles on like a f- ceiling fan coming down from a ceiling fan blows blows my mind. I never thought I'd ever see anything like that. Yeah. Um, you been writing? I've been writing a lot, actually. This has been a really prolific time for me. I mean, in fact, I... I'm amazed that when the pandemic started, I have a good friend who we talked about how we're going to approach the the pandemic writing wise. And she and I both joined uh, a Zoom meetup or a Zoom workshop, I guess, with this writer out of Texas who does a lot of horror writing named Tom Vaughn. And it was amazing because he, in a couple long workshops, really set me in motion to just write and understand the craft. And it just, it changed everything. So for me, like pandemic time has been really good. It's been extremely good. I, I've written more and more variety of things than ever before. Yeah, I feel like the same way. Like, I've always been a person who um, I always wanted the time. I always felt like the times were moving quicker than me. And I don't know uh, if you've ever read this French author. His name is Celine. He inspired some of the beat writers, um, kind of a douchebag. So he's kind of being canceled these days. But um, he he once wrote 
in one of his books about how he wished Paris would just stop for a moment so he could catch his breath. And I always felt like that about the world. I'm like, I have all these ideas, but just the times are moving too quick for me to really get them down. And then so this year, I just finally, finally did it. I, I, I just tackled all of these projects I've been waiting 20 years to, to tackle, like big projects too. Like um, I've always wanted to write this three season series 10 episodes per season it's a limited run doesn't go beyond three seasons i never had the time to write anything like that i finally tackled that um i tackled all these screenplays about growing up that i wanted to to write um and because because 2020 really allowed me room to move from one headspace to the other without really having to think much about you know, commuting to some client or something like that. Like, there were no clients. All my clients moved to either Florida or Texas. Because <laughs> um, that's what rich people do in times like this. Um, and so, okay, there's no clients. I don't have to worry about going into a headspace only to have to come out of it again to work. So I very casually just moved from one project to the other to the other. And I was just so busy. Um, and I, and I found that a lot of the, a lot of the artists I brought on this year are kind of saying the same thing for the most part that this year they've been the most productive they've ever been. I think, I think for me and, and maybe for you as well, like there is freedom in shifting focus. There's, there's a lot of freedom in not having to bring something fully to fruition or hit a deadline or get to the finish line. So you can take it as far as you want. And at the same time, it's allowed me, kind of like you, like to jump into something I've wanted to do for a while and just seize it and know that I don't have to take it to the point of, say, a fully finished script or even a full finished synopsis. It could just be a log line. It could just be the log line and synopsis. It could just be a short story. And and I think that's the thing I've made the most peace in the last year in my writing is that everything is just a pebble to, to push up a hill. And I have lots of pebbles. We all have lots of pebbles we're pushing up the hill. And I don't say a rock or a, or a, or a boulder. I'm talking about just pebbles and being comfortable with just keeping the progress going because that pebble is going to, you know, take me to some other place. Um, like, for example, last week, I was just compelled to tell this story that is a real story. It's a true story. And it's happened in my life and I'm, I'm part of the story. But somehow watching something on TV made me think, I have to write this. And I just let it brew, and it brewed, and it brewed, and the next morning, I do dishes by hand. I have a dishwasher, but I do dishes by hand, yeah. because it gives me time to think. I'm washing dishes by hand. I put them in the dishwasher for rinse. And as I'm washing dishes one morning, uh, Friday or Saturday morning, the story is like yelling in my head, just write me. And so I sat down with the log line, and by the end of the day, I had a 772-word uh, synopsis. And that story was really just in my head for the last 24 hours before that. But I told myself, I don't have to do the synopsis. I can just write the log line. Or I don't have to write the script. I can just do the synopsis. But I think about power and peace for me in knowing that I could just create something, just get something done, and see how much stamina I have or how much focus I have on that. And then when I hit a point where I feel like I'm done for the moment, set it aside. Yeah, I love that dishwashing idea too because that's, um, that's something as a... I was a writing tutor some years back when I went back to school. Um, the college put me in sort of the tutoring department. And um, one of the things that, one of the recommendations I always made to students after they've read a book and then they got to write a response to it, um, take a break, do the dishes, or go for a walk, or take a shower and think about it first. And the the feedback I got from students was, they were amazed at, at that advice because they hadn't considered allowing themselves time. They thought they had to do it immediately before they forgot. I'm like, no, take the, take the time. If you have a dishwasher, don't use it. Just do it in the sink. I, I swear it works. It works in, at, at an academic level and it works at a creative level to just take the time to think about it before you sit down to actually work on it. Um, and so just hearing that, like, it's so clear that you've, you've been around, you've been around the block. 
uh, that you, you've you've figured this out. You figured out this this. Uh, it's almost like a secret. It's a secret <laughs> that I think people, if they stick with it long enough, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out that these chores are actually a good thing for the creative spirit. Well, you step back and you realize that because it doesn't have to be done today, and you're not you're not really on a deadline. Unless somebody hired you and paying you and saying, I need, you know, thirty pages by you know, the next thirty days. Um, what I keep learning is like, you know, attendees and Zoom meetings and these webinars is set up set a, a course that maybe is five years long. Like think about five years for your skip. And when you think about five years for your skip, it's not to procrastinate on starting. It's to, it's to really enjoy the journey and enjoy where it takes you because it could start as a TV show. Uh, in your case, you're talking about writing a series a few moments ago. Like it could start as a TV show and then, and then become something else. Or it could start as a movie and become a TV show. It could start as a TV show and become a book. Hmm. I mean, the idea is that we don't know, you know, where it's going to take us. And I got a great lesson in LA. When I was in, uh, in LA, I got to, um, I got to go to the screening of, of Downsizing, the Alexander Payne um, film. And it was amazing to have read his book about his filmmaking career and to have read the chapter where he talked about downsizing being shelved. Meaning like before it was released, or before it was made, they had already had it in development for years. And so I think by the time that it came out, 10 years had passed. And so when you read stories like that as a writer, you realize... Even people at the at their at the top of their game, even directors and writers at the top of their game, understand that things go you know go a certain way. They may you might put years into something, it doesn't get doesn't work out. You might put years into something, it gets shot and never gets distributed, or never gets or gets into six episodes of a series being shot and then being shelved by a network. So you can't bank on the things that you're doing, but you also can't let it stop you from continuing. You just got to keep forging ahead because. You don't know what magic you're creating. You just got to keep creating. Yeah, you know what blew my mind initially? I, I, I exited film school around 2001. And I would I would hear about how these big popular movies, who were they were like A-list movies in like the late 90s, early 2000s. And then I'd hear people say, oh, I remember when that script was introduced in the 80s. I'm like, it took that long? <laughs> just yeah. the, the, the timeline blows my mind because... You, there were movies from that era too, where like their scripts were introduced when I was still a baby. <laughs> like, and it just you know they they get bought, but then they get shelved, and then somebody will consider it and they're like, nah, I'll shelve it again, and then somebody will develop it and invest in the development of it, and then they'll shelve it again, and it, it's such a weird, weird process. It's it's like a long term relationship. Yeah, you know, if you're going to collaborate with somebody, whether it's a co-writer or you're, or you're talking about casting. It's a casting, you know, actors. Um, I always think this business is a long-term relationship. Who are you willing to spend the next five or ten years with? And that's the same same about your script. Like, are you willing to spend five years on the script? And when I tell people that, see, I have I have people at my level, you know, I network horizontally like you're supposed to, and I talk to people about the things I learn and share what I'm learning. And it blows their mind when I say, take five years. Think about your script for five years. Do you want to be in a relationship with this script for the next five years? I mean, I'm working on a pilot script right now that's that's getting submitted. And it got started almost two years ago. And it's taken more, it's taken on more of a life. It's taken on more dimensions. Um, but when I started it, I I fully expected, this is a long haul. This is not going to gonna go quickly. It's going to be something that, if I just aim to shoot it as a short film, then maybe I'll have it done and everything will be done in a year and we'll edit it and we'll screen it at some festival. When it became a TV show idea, then it takes on a video. Life. And it's something that not only could take three, four, five years to get to the point of being made, it can run for five or 10 years. And do I want to be a part of a show um, that goes 15 years from development to, to, to being shot? I mean, look at SVU. You're talking, you know, shows with two decades on the air. I mean, do you want to set that in motion? Do your, does your concept, your idea have that kind of, what kind of legs? Yeah. Um, so you have to, I think, pick carefully. Choose carefully what you're going to invest your time in because you can do, a, you can write and shoot a short film 
and get it done quickly. But if you have a story that you say, this has some weight, this needs, this demands an audience, you've got to nurture that thing. And it could take years just to get people to look at it. Yeah, I mean, my current film that I'm, cur- uh, I'm, I'm editing it, I have the visual effects currently being worked on. Um, I started writing that thing in 2017. It didn't really become producible until 2019. And then 2020, we had a false start on the production. And then when New York opened up productions in July, I sort of managed to cobble together the production and shoot it in under a month. So not only am I living with it, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. Then if the timing works out, I'm also living with it in 2022 as a pitchable project to distributors because it's done. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I'm living with it for the rest of my life because it'll be out there. And I mean, I have content going back over 10 years where I'm still getting occasional emails about or, you know, submission form for your, through your website. What was up with this mind fuck of a movie? Like, <laughs> which is typically the response, but yeah. you, you, you're living with it for the rest of your life, which, which, um, I mean, anybody who's part of, who's been part of the Star Wars or Marvel universe knows that there's no going back once you're involved in some of these projects. Um, yeah, it just, it, it's, it's, it's a really interesting profession. And, and an interesting way of life in that regard. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about my dad, who um, is celebrating a birthday this month and was a big fan of pinball when I was growing up. So if we went to the bowling alley or any kind of arcade, I'd see my dad always go right to the pinball machine. And he's a master at pinball. Like It was just amazing to watch, especially as a kid. I was watching him keep this ball in motion. And I, I thought a lot about that as a writer, in that when we're shepherding projects like we are, we're really just trying to keep that ball in motion. We're trying not to lose, you know, lose a turn. And it hits a lot of different surfaces. It bounces, it slides, it, you know, rebounds, it, you know, it does all the movements it does. And we don't know what it's going to do next. So we're always in that reactive state of how do we keep this thing, this metal ball in motion. And if our script is the metal ball, we're really trying not to lose it. We don't want to lose the opportunity. We don't want it to be shut. We don't want to, we don't want it to disappear from the landscape. But we also don't know what kind of what surfaces it's going to hit. Like I sent just an introduction to myself of myself to um, a literary rep last week, and I didn't even describe the the pilot script. I just gave an overview of the genres and my connection to the story, and her response was, "This sounds very interesting." Like I, like I want, I wanted to hear more. It wasn't enough information for her to know the story. It was just, I'm going to give you a, the smallest of peek through this window of what you could see, and that was a great, you know, to go back to the analogy. It was a great surface to hit because it resonated with her. Whatever words I used, and now she's got my, you know, signed release form. She's got my script. She's got my my synopsis. She's got a link to my pitch deck. And it wasn't me even trying to sell. I wasn't actively selling. I'm just like, hey, check this out. You're gonna like. You're gonna like what you see. Um, and I could do that same approach to other people, and they could just go, never mind, we're not interested. But you hit that nice, you know, sweet surface, and you're like, wow, someone really, someone's really interested. Or, or whatever I said, hit the mark. Yeah, I love that pinball analogy, um, because as you were describing this person's reaction, it's almost like you. You decided to ex- experiment with another way of hitting the hitting the side button, and then suddenly it's dancing. The ball I could see the ball dancing on one part that you probably didn't even think of initially. Oh, I didn't even see that part there. Now I know to aim for that. You know, <laughs> um, I uh, I loved what you were writing about mentorship. That's not something that I think is discussed enough in this industry. Um, for those of you listening, we initially connected on Twitter. I don't remember how. Probably writing stuff, right? Yeah, writing stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And so you're very active. You're very good at Twitter. You're much better than I am. 
I, it's taken time. It's taken more than 10 years to get to a point where I feel slightly confident. <laughs> I mean, it's been a lot of practice. I've come and gone so many times. I, I just, I, I don't even, I can't even tell you, but, um, I've only had one other guest on here who had talked about mentorship and in, in the arts and, I think it's different with every medium, but film, I think, for the most part, is lacking because there's this there's this problem I noticed when I went to film school is everybody who could potentially have been a mentor saw up and coming students as potential threats. Mm. So we had this, you know, I went through a very technical program in Vancouver where, you know, you took, you took a course in directing, you took a course in editing and you just kind of touched upon a little bit, every component of filmmaking. And I remember the directing, the guy in charge of directing and teaching us how to, the basics of how to be directors. Um, he was just threatened. He was threatened by the idea of vision and by the idea of us having all these, we're coming in with these ideas of these projects we want to do after film school. And the moment he got offered a directing gig overseas, he, he was out. He was out in the middle of our first semester. He's like, goodbye. And it's just like that. And that seems to have been the type of person I've encountered the most, um, which is weird because you would think that they would have noticed the baby boomers kind of got it right in that regard the way Lucas and Spielberg worked together, the way Coppola mentored uh, Lucas at one point. You know, I, I don't see that in the generations from the late 80s on, you know. It's, it's all everybody looking at one another as competition. And I, I don't know, I don't know how to change an entire industry, especially one that, I don't consider myself a part of. I've always done everything independently of that system. But how do you how do you bring mentorship into something like that when you have all of these you have all these weird factors that doesn't exist in most other other areas? Like you have um, agents and managers and executives, and they're all feeding this thing that doesn't really allow the idea of mentorship. To become a normal part of the process. Oh. Well, I hope that makes sense. Well, it does make sense because you're making me think of this, Eric, and that is social media tends to promote outcomes. Like it tends to be a, a platform for outcomes. We want to see the finished results. We want to see the trailer. We want to see the, the, the link to the finished film, or we want to know where we can find it on TV or on streaming. Or we want to see. Um, even in an earlier situation, you want to see that you, for an actor, you, like, you booked the role. So that's, those are the outcomes. Um, what people tend to resist, I think, when it comes to mentorship is letting us see how the sausage gets made. Like letting us know that it, it, you know, it, it, it's a journey. We see all the inner workings of the pinball machine. You know, we can see how, for the most part, we can see how all the, you know, all the, the service areas come together and, and what happens. But I think with social media, like I... I see it as an opportunity to, to be very transparent about thanking people, thanking people who are helping me, thanking groups that, that provide me with, with resources. Because I want people to know this is a journey. This is not, I'm not showing you an outcome. I'm saying I submitted for a fellowship. I submitted to, to be a part of a retreat. I submitted my script. Love your cat, by the way. What a kitty. <laughs> She's playful right now. Making a, making a difference. <laughs> but I, but I, I, love the, I love the idea of, of normalizing that I'm on a journey. So I want people to see that there's rejection. I want people to see that I, I took this lesson from somebody. I want people to see that somebody tagged me in a post that led to me getting a paid writing gig. And it might be just writing corporate scripts, but it's at the part of the journey. And I think normalizing that as a creative is important. I, it's not about the flash. It's not about, Hey, look at, look at me. I did something great. It's about I'm putting in the work. And there's a lot of work to be put in and there's going to be some failures and that's okay. And I don't know that social media is set up for that. Yeah, definitely not. Um, and that's one of the things that I've been conscious of with the podcast is in unpacking the process of, of some of the artists on here. I'm also trying to get them to be 
more open about kind of what's not working what or what the technical stuff is. Uh, and it's not even just artists. This week I released an episode with um, an entrepreneur who had a startup and I'm like, all right, how did you manage your supply chain? Like how, how do you, as a, this is your first business, I'm interested in how you even knew to start to put together a supply chain because that's mystifying to me. And that's usually something most people would keep under the, under the hood. Like, oh, that's, that's my talent and I only sell that talent to the investors and <laughs> that's for them to know. Um, but, you know, that's one of the reasons I, I wanted this podcast is I do want to kind of demystify the process um, of just being able to sustain a creative life and, you know, maybe inspire, it's, inspire mentorship. Um, because I, I don't think that's the way art, the arts are, are taught these days really work. It's just too, it, it creates too many insulated bubbles, I guess. Well, I, I do see a lot of the aggressive side of it where people are, are actively, proactively, aggressively wanting to enlist students, followers. You know, this is the way to write a script, right? And I'm not saying that, you know, there's not good resources for that. But there, there is a percentage of people, and it comes in all parts of the industry, of people who kind of get that authoritarian uh, type of approach, like, I have all the answers. You need to listen to me. And, and I think that, you know, that's counterproductive, too. Yeah. But, but everyone says that it's really about creating relationships. And mentorship is no different. Like, you're, you're trying to identify... Who, who is the right mentor for you? So you have to kind of try on a lot of different outfits and see which one fits. And not everyone's going to fit. You're not going to have alignment um, with everybody. But you are going to find people eventually that, that speak to you in a way that you listen and you take, you know, take action on the things they say and you respect that and you, and you give back to that. And you, you, know, you acknowledge that. You honor that in some way. Maybe it's a shout out on social media and thanking them. Um, maybe it's, you know, referring other people to that, or maybe it's sharing the things that they, that, that they share, um, by showing that you take them and what they offer seriously, but it's gotta be, it's gotta feel like, it's gotta feel like what they're offering you has value beyond just you as thinking of it transactionally. I don't mean value, like that you took the idea and you suddenly made a million dollars. I mean, like there's an ongoing sense of you're growing from this person. You're learning from this person, and it may it may it may seep into your personal life. It may go beyond your professional life and seep into how you conduct yourself in your personal life, how you mentor other people. Even you know, there's this kind of this cyclical type of approach, and that to me is when mentorship works best. When they inspire me, when my mentors inspire me to want to inspire other people, you know, you have the, the pay it forward thinking, and then I feel really good because I'm like, I just learned this really cool chunk of stuff. I have to tell other people about it. I want to let them know because I don't want them to do the same frustrating thing that I did. What to do next? I want to take that information, that perspective, and go here. I'm just going to give it to you. You don't, you don't have to use it, but but if you use it, you know, let me know how it works for you. Let let me know, and then I'll let this other person know, and we can all kind of share in that that knowledge. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I love that. Have you ever heard the term lifelong learner? Yes. I always see myself as that, and I think that. That could be the healthiest way for people to think about this life. If you adopt a lifelong learning philosophy, it's healthier than just focusing in on the uh, successes, on the, the results, or as you say, the outcomes. Um, well, things change too. I mean, it, the thing is, if you, if, you, if you stop at some point when you're 25 or 35 or 45 or 55, you stop attempting to learn, you forget that things around you are changing yeah. and you've got to change with them. You've got to, you know, it's as simple as like, we don't use black and white headshots anymore. If you're still using black and white headshots, you've missed the cue and it's been a pretty big cue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think this could be what saves social media, to be honest, is finding a way to integrate that into the, the normal, the normalities and the expectations is what, what did I learn this week? <laughs> you know, Rather than what did I achieve this week? I like that. Yeah. Um, so you have a you have a lot of acting credits too. I saw forty five. Yeah, I, I have I have done a lot of acting. I've done a lot of commercials. I've done some you know short films and TV appearances. 
things like that. And what's funny is I think my acting was driven by a need for attention. Like I look at that now clearly. And I think my acting was really fueled by look at me. I want people to see me. And part of it comes from being a large family. Like I grew up in a large family. I have, I have on my mom's side alone, like almost 60 first cousins. Are you a middle child? What's that? Are you a middle child? I am the second oldest of five. Uh, but that's, that's a whole other story. I was raised with four siblings, but I've got half siblings that go beyond the number of 20. So like, I just connected to half the world, I feel like, some days. Yeah. Um, so there was, that, there was that need for attention, I think. And I look at that now as a writer and think, yeah, I was definitely raising my hand like, pick me, pick me, pick me. And now as a writer, with more of my focus on writing, I really want the story to come first. I want the, the focus to be on the words, on the story, on the characters which is why in social media in the last year, since the pandemic started, I post very few photos. I post very few, like, real, like, like actual photos of myself in real times. I posted one recently. Um, I may have posted a couple before that in the last several months of 2020. I posted a few in a mask, things like that. But most of my focus is, this is my log line, or this is a photo I took that conveys a certain message, or this is a graphic design I created to promote myself as a writer. So I feel like the work, for the first time in my life, I can say thanks to the pandemic, the work comes first. Like I am just a vessel for that work. And I don't need to put my face on social media. I don't need to be actively posting everything that I'm doing um, because I really want to focus on what's the message in my content? What am I trying to say with it? And my face doesn't do that. My words do that, but posting a picture of myself doesn't do that. Is there a noticeable difference in the feedback that you would get though between posting something of posting a picture of you versus posting an update about your work like the 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 posting something posting content that's obviously from the self versus posting content that's just about the work i guess if that makes any kind of sense i think i think from my from my point of view i feel like people don't necessarily follow what i'm posting like it's it's a little more abstract mm. because I, as i said before like you could post the outcome. Like, I could post a movie poster and people would get the movie poster. Like, if I post something that's sort of easily digestible, they get it. If I post something that's more than the mechanics of writing and coming up with a script and writing a log line, I don't think most of my followers understand that. I think the, the general public that, you know, I'm connected to, friends and family and, you know, acquaintances, I don't think they understand that process. It'd be like taking you into a factory where they make, you know, Nerf balls and going, hey, here's the process of making Nerf balls. Um, Nobody cares. We want to play with the Nerf balls. We want to, you know, shoot the, shoot, shoot the Nerf gun. Um, but we don't necessarily want to see the working parts of how the, the stuff gets made. So I think my, my approach tends to be a little more, uh, a little more inaccessible for people. If I post a photo of myself on set, boom, they get it. If I post a, a photo of me or a video of me at an audition or auditioning, um, a little audition clip or a monologue, people get it. Like it's just, it's so easily consumed. Um, but I don't, I just not. That's not my approach anymore. Like I feel like abandoning that approach and, and making it more about what's coming, what's coming from within, um, probably makes it a little harder for people to follow me <laughs> because they don't always know what kind of conversation I'm trying to have. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's that sounds about accessible. Um, yeah, I was liking those on set pictures as the necessary media for parents to consume to know that their kids are working. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, the onset photos are completely useless. <laughs> yeah, it's just really, it's just, hey, look at me. I'm like, I'm, I, I think it's all of it is, is basically like, it's justification for your choices, right? Like, see, this is proof that I can justify my choices to be an actor because there's a picture of me on set or here's me auditioning. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's about vanity. I guess what I'm saying is like, we're all trying to be relevant. We're all trying to make our choices seem relevant. So if you're, if you're acting, you want people to know that you're getting something, that something's happening for you. So you blow it up. It's got to be on every social media platform. You've got to, you know, you've got to keep people engaged and interested. Um, I think as a writer, it's, it's, it's weirder to do that because the visual thing isn't there. I mean, we, we're all, we are shifting that though. Cause like there's certain Twitter accounts, for example, that say, show me the first page of your script or show me the, the page where you introduce your character. Show us, share a screenshot. And, and what they're trying to do is make it visual, make what we do as writers visual before it gets shot, because it's just a, it's just a script, right? It's just, 
words on a page. It's just a blueprint for what we're going to shoot eventually. Yeah. So it's harder to make that an interesting visual. It's not, hey, a photo of, you know, the star of the show. It's just a piece of paper with black text on it. And somehow you've got to make someone interested in reading that text, which is even more challenging. Like, am I going to stop and look at the screenshot and actually read interior, you know, uh, old man's bedroom? Uh, nights. Am I going to, do I care about that? You know, writers, we care about that. The general public, it, they might not care about that. Yeah. Well, I, I, at one point, somebody likened screenwriting to just instruct, to being instruction manuals for somebody yeah. else. Yeah. Um, which, um, I guess to a certain extent, that's true. But at the same time, I love reading screenplays for enjoyment. <laughs> so, but I'm, I, I think we're, that, that, individual is a rare individual um well it's not it's not it's not a story like like a like a short story is or like a book is like you have to you have to stop and recognize that you're reading an assembly of parts yeah like, you, I, like it is an instruction manual in the sense of like you're reading like your car's manual and seeing how all the you know, parts come together and all that but but you and i and, and people like us like we're sophisticated enough to, to, to pick up that script and to read it and to get the fact that all the working parts are coming together. We see the visual. We understand what certain things mean. We know the simple, simplicity of interior versus exterior, morning versus night, like all that stuff we grasp. And then in the action, we read the action and think, ooh, what are they showing us? What does this reveal? Or how might this get shot in the show? So we, for us, it's like, I, I consider it kind of a wonderland to read someone else's script. It doesn't matter how good or bad it is. Like I just consider it a wonderland of, I can, I can hear what the writer was thinking. With every word. Yeah. I, uh, this is making me want to sit down and write, um, which is good indicator. Good. Uh, I loved, I love following Kevin Smith's sort of career as a writer because he's very proactive about disclosing what he learns and when. Mm -hmm. um, and when he, he, he was, podcasting about doing some Netflix show for masters of the universe. He had been told by the producers, don't write a fight scene, just write fighty fighty and we'll do the fight scene. And so he just writes fighty fighty. And I'm like that, that, and all these years he just learned how to do that, you know? And I, I love stuff like that where somebody experienced can come out of the woodwork and say, I've been in this thing for this this long. Here's what I just learned that other people are doing. Um, I'm thinking of that now for some reason because we're talking about the script as a set of instructions. Um, his instruction was, this is essentially a fight scene. I don't care about the details. Do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, that, that's brilliant. That's genuinely brilliant because someone someone's figured out a way to make this easier that you're going to go to a person who knows how to do this and the execution is going to be it's going to it's going to top whatever's in the script yeah. unless you unless you know how to put it all into words to turn the visual into words don't even bother you know let yourself be guided by somebody who's who's made the mistake of trying too hard to work too hard on a certain area and 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 just figure out how to problem solve based on what they did by the way i i rang to kevin smith when i was living in in Culver City, and I was just down the street from um, Sony Pictures, and I was in a I was at the gas station right across from Culver uh, from uh, Sony on Culver Boulevard. It was the gas station I always went to, and I'm standing there like filling the tank, and I see this like guy, and you know like you catch something out of the corner of your eye that seems odd, like odd behavior. It was this guy running from the back of the the, the building where there's a car wash. And he's running out, like through landscaping. He's like jumping over like a, a, a bush or something. And I look over, and it's just like it's this guy in a hockey jersey. I'm like, that's weird. And I didn't fully look at who it was, but he goes in the store, and then I go inside to, to grab some, some some stuff to drink. And I'm standing at the back of the line, and I see in front in the front of the line is the same guy with a hockey jersey that says his name um, on the back, and I know it's Kevin Smith. And so the whole time I'm staying there and I'm watching him like pay for his stuff. And I'm like, he's going to pass by me because I'm at the back of the line and he's going to pass by me on the way 
out the door. And I love Kevin Smith's work and, I, and his podcast is awesome and all these things I know about him. And I just, my head's going, what do I do? So the thing I figured out is I need to say something to him. But then I'm like, what do I call him? Like, do I call him Mr. Smith? Do I call him Kevin like I know him? And so he turns around, he comes to the line. He sees me obviously looking at him. He makes eye contact with me. And I'm, now I'm stuck. What do I say? And I can't think of what to say. He says, hey, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> and that's it. And he walked out and I thought, it's weird. Like, I'm not gen generally starstruck. But I like him and I appreciate his work. And he was he was uh, working across the street directing an episode of, of The Goldberg for ABC, mm. uh, which I later watched. But it was such a funny encounter. And, and I realized, like, even as a, as a writer and as, as an actor, like, sometimes that's going to happen. You're going to run into somebody that you have this great appreciation for. And there's going to be that moment. And I just wasn't prepared for it. And it still comes to, comes to mind this day and it cracks me up. Yeah, I, I tend to suffer from a condition where I don't ever recognize them until like three days later. And in Manhattan, it happens all the time, like at least once a month. I'll see somebody um, and it won't register until a couple of days later. Oh, wait a minute. That was Anna Kendrick or Sam Jackson. How do I, How the fuck did I miss Sam Jackson? Mm -hmm. But I did. I've actually missed him three times. <laughs> that happened to me on the on the hike. One of my uh, last hikes when I was in LA. My last hikes, or actually the last hike I did, to the Hollywood sign. And I did the I did the hike where you go behind the sign. Yeah, I've done that. So you've done that, right? Yeah. So you so you know like there's a part where you're coming back down, and there's like sort of a a nice top to the hill with a real rough terrain, and and I'm walking down, and I'm exhausted, and I finished my my water's basically turned warm at that point. And it's only April, but my, my water bottle is now solid, solidly warm. And there's a guy approaching me with two other people with him. And he's walking towards me, and I'm just like, just weary with the heat and exhaustion. And he says hello to me. And I'm like, damn, this guy looks familiar. And I'm like, I know, he, I know I know him. I couldn't figure out who it was. And I'm about 30 feet past him, and I turn around, and I look back at him, and I'm like, oh shit, that's Shamar Moore. From criminal minds like how did i not know his face but in my exhaustion like i just did and i was thinking i would have said something like hey shamar what's going on or enjoy the hype shamar but he looked he probably looked at me like oh here's somebody who doesn't have a clue who i am because <laughs> i my plate my face was totally blank i had no reaction i'm like this is another hiker one more hiker going to the sign <laughs> yeah i i think on that hike i wouldn't have even cared i was so thirsty by the time i got to the top and there's nothing up there, so and it's Mount Lee is really really dusty, mm -hmm. and then you got to work your way all the way back down. Um, they should install water fountains up there, but you know, <laughs> telling LA to do anything you know. or sell just sell water on along the way, you station people up and down. Yeah, <laughs> it could make a killer. It, it was brutal. Like I found myself, and I walked, I hiked before, but with more. People around it felt like I was energized. Like there were more people going up, you know, some of the main trails. But going up the back way was really was kind of isolating. I there was very few people I saw. I was kind of I was hiking by myself. Were you on the fire way. road? The road. So because I know there's like a paved fire road. Mm, no, it was like it came from the, the trail I got on. It came from like one of the neighborhoods in the hills. Like I remember, cause I actually walked. Not only did I hug to the to the to the sign, I walked from my apartment in Studio City. Oh, so wow. like there was a two, there was a two mile initial walk, and then I did the hike, and I was like, my left, I was like, I feel great. And when I came back down, I was like, my legs don't want to work. Like, I, now I'm now I'm gonna try to catch the bus. I'm gonna get back down to Ventura, and I'm gonna try to catch the bus home. And I waited for the bus, and I waited for the bus, and the buses came, and I'm like, I guess I'm walking home. <laughs> it was really exhausting. When I uh, when I first went out there, it was June of 2009. Might have been 2008, actually. Um, I underestimated big time how big LA is. My perspective is New York City. Everything's mm -hmm. walkable for the most part. Yeah. Um, and so I was staying near Miracle Mile, uh, which is I guess Beverly Hills, um, and I would walk all the way to Hollywood Boulevard. From there 
mm-hmm. and then I would walk into the hills and then I'd walk back and it was brutal. And I mean, that's a, that's a lot of miles in, in the heat without no, no cloud cover whatsoever. So it's desert sun. Uh, oh, people, people look at you weird, by the way, if you do a lot of walking in LA, like with a backpack. Cause I think most of the time, I think people thought I was a homeless guy because I was, you know, my long hair and my, my backpack is on and I'm wearing my, my sneakers and jeans and flannel. And I got some, I got a lot of looks. And then of course people thought I was carrying drugs most of the time. I get random people, but I did the walk from, uh, I sometimes did the walk from Culver city to Wilshire to go over to the sag aftra headquarters to do workshops. And that's a, that's a walk too. That's like two or three mile walk. Mm. Through the you know through a hilly area, but I like walking. Like I I traveled all over LA. I would take the bus. I would take the, the, the train. Um, I would I would use you know I would drive when I had a car. I would take when I didn't didn't have a car. I would I would use a Lyft or an Uber. I loved exploring LA, and I found like when I didn't have a car in LA was when I loved LA the most because I got to know every part of that city. And and we're talking like from downtown to you know. To the, to the valley, I got to know all of it because I, I wanted to explore. When I was in Culver City, I just sort of stayed in Culver City, and I was sort of like, this is my neighborhood, and I live close to Sony, and I'm walking distance from downtown. But to me, like, the joy of that city is like, you got to get out. you got to see what things are. I was, um, I was at the, um, I was at the, one of the malls in the valley, and I started striking up a conversation with um, a guy I knew, I knew who he was, I recognize his face, but we never exchanged names or anything. And it was Ed Begley Jr. And he's at a C's candy store in the mall. And that to me was part of the LA life was that you're just going to cross paths. I worked at a, a restaurant where I held the door open for Bill Hader. And he said, thanks, bud. Um, and I got to know, uh, through a couple of visits, I got to know um, Ty Burrell, who plays uh, Phil Dunphy on Modern Family. He came to the restaurant where I worked. And we had a conversation. The next time he came in, you know, we talked even some more. And then I got to work. Um, I got booked one day working as a, a working background on Modern Family. And also, you know, now I am, I'm in Century City and I'm on, and I'm on the, and I'm on the lot for, for their show. And to me, like, as an actor, as a creative person, it's, you're around so much in LA. You're around so much of, of, of the creative entertainment field. But the difference is this. This is the difference I found from, say, Texas to LA is people there talk about the business. Like here we talk about the craft, like we're talking about writing a script. In LA, all the conversations were like business conversations. Yeah. You know, how did something get made? That to me is a very different approach. It wasn't about the creative aspect of it. It was about how do we create relationships with people who are decision makers? How do we get something? How do we get this, this script pitch? How do I get myself representation from a competitive agent or a manager? And so to me, like, it was like putting your big boy pants on and thinking like, this is, this is the big show. This is the real deal. And I, I'm coming from a, a, a small, much smaller regional market where we just talked about what role do you wanted to do? You know, how do we get the next role? What did you, did you find that there's, um, I've always wondered about like so much of the independent cinema, like the really independent cinema. Um, I never see it out of LA, uh, it's usually out of Austin, New mm-hmm. York. There's a lot going on in New England and Chicago, but I never really see indie films out of LA. Do you know is the spirit just not there, or, or is there something about the way it's structured that it's just hard harder to pull off? Um, what I found is the art of collaboration is different there. Like I didn't, I didn't experience. This might be just personal to me, but. I didn't experience the same thing I've experienced in Dallas or Austin or Houston, you know, where I've done a lot of work. I didn't experience the same sense of like putting a team together and just making it happen. Yeah. It, it seemed like people seem to have a lot more um, you know, obstacles. And, and part, some of it may be like the, the, the resistance to travel. Like when I was, when I was in living in Culver city and doing an acting class in North Hollywood every Friday night, you know, I would either drive or I would lift up. And that's like, that's a significant drive. I'm going up the 405 to the 101. And I'm spending like, in, in rush hour traffic, on a Friday afternoon, I'm spending like an hour, an hour and a half in traffic, right? So, But I'm willing to do that for that class. Um, and then I tell people, 
when I was in LA, I tell people about Texas. And so when I was based in Houston, um, Houston and Dallas are four hours apart. Dallas to Austin is like three, three and a half hours, right? There was t- there were times where I would audition in those cities on the same day. I would I would leave Houston, go to Dallas, go to Austin, go back to Houston, and I'd do this like triangle shaped drive, so to speak. Um, and that would take up my whole day, and I'd have two or three auditions. And so I think in Texas, like we're accustomed to putting in more time, putting in more effort, working with people, just getting a team together and making it happen. And I just didn't see that in LA in, in my travels. I didn't. I saw it on smaller things, smaller shoots. Um, but I didn't see the same level of commitment. And we're talking like to make a feature, you know, indie feature, it takes weeks. It might take weeks to shoot it. And you might be shooting it in pieces. Yeah. You know, you might just be getting together on the weekend. I just, I just feel like there's more of an entrepreneurial creative spirit here in Texas than I've seen like it. Yeah. I get that impression too. Mm-hmm. I remember, um, I did a, a few years stint advising various festivals in New York on their programming and, we got next to no movies from Southern California. Like it just, they were, they weren't coming from California. Um, we, it was mostly Texas, New York, and I guess the upper Midwest, but it's, it's super weird to me. Um, cause it's ultimately the Mecca of the industry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it should be setting that bar pretty high. Like you'd think they would set a pretty high standard. Um, I w- was in the Midwest for a couple of years and I saw, um, I've seen, you know, in Chicago, a pretty strong market. I mean, especially now that they've got ongoing television series shooting. I think that's solidified Chicago, um, as a third market, but, but we do struggle here. I mean, yes. Texas does struggle, man. We, we, we've struggled with incentives for years of enticing people to, to come shoot here, to create here. Um, we've gotten lucky on occasion of getting, you know, a series like the sun on AMC to shoot a couple of years here but it's hard to entice people to shoot in a state where there's just not as much incentive as say shooting in new mexico and new mexico will double for texas a lot in a given year um so it 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 means like it doesn't help our you know our our crews it doesn't help our actors have regular work so they're always hungry like they always want to create something they always want to you know make a short film or be doing something creating some kind of content because the steady flow of work just isn't there what is the the primary incentive? Is it just tax taxation? That's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's it's something that, and I remember lobbying with a group years ago. We have an organization called uh, the Texas Motion Picture Alliance, and so they actively promote shooting in Texas, and and not just motion pictures. I mean, we're talking video games and TV shows. But it's it's I think you know the the obstacle we have here is that is making the legislators here understand that it's a viable industry. I mean, we're the energy capital, so people understand gas and oil. You know, they understand the energy field, um, but they don't really understand how television and film works because they see it as an outside entity, like Hollywood's coming to Texas and the money's going to pay the outside people. They don't realize that it's, it's people here. It's the hotels here. It's the, the forests here. It's the actors here. It's the, it's the crew that's based in Austin or San Antonio, Dallas, it's all these people, you know, with boots on the ground in Texas already that benefit from, from working. I, and I worked, you know, I worked on, on, on freelance projects, um, in new van entertainment where I get paid because somebody needs somebody who, who has my skill. I get paid whether that, you know, that, that entity is in New York city or in LA. So, you know, that money is coming from the outside coming here, keeps a lot of us working. But when we don't have internal support from the state, at the state level, it's it's devastating. We don't have we don't have a strong enough advocacy here to make it seem enticing and to reward you know to incentivize producers to come here to make their video games, to make their movies, to make their TV shows. Um, in the same way other states do. It's interesting. I haven't really. Cause you figure, like Texas would bend over backwards because they bend over backwards for every other industry. Um, it's interesting though that they they'll always see them as like an outside visit visit visiting industry, never a never a, a home industry, I guess. Well, I think there's a lack of awareness of everyday people like me, and and you know what 
what it means for me to, to make the paycheck um, as a freelance writer means that there's companies that hire me to write a script. You know, I'm just talking on a corporate level at this point. I don't think there's an awareness of this kind of work. You know, what it means to have an outside entity, a company that's like I have a client that is in Austin, but he works for a larger company that's based in the Northeast, like in Connecticut, somewhere like that. Um, so the money I get paid for that work comes from Connecticut. It doesn't come from Austin. And because they, because he identifies me as a writer for the, for his project, then I'm working through him, but I'm getting paid by this this larger company. So that's that's somebody in Texas who's able to pay rent or buy groceries because you know there's there's talent that's sourced in the Lone Star State, and I don't know that legislators you know understand just how many creative um, how deep our creative pool is here. I don't think they see it. They see. They see the big names coming in. Like if Regina King comes in and is doing a show here, you know, or Friday Night Lights and Friday Night Lights shot here, like they see that that at the top level. But they don't I don't think they're really acquainted with the minutia of people like me at my level and what we do and how anything that comes this way, like, you know, keeps us keep a roof of our head. They also and and this takes me back to earlier in twenty twenty when there was so much education about the gig economy because people didn't understand it and New York had to pass new rules so that gig workers could get collect unemployment. I mean, pre previously it wasn't structured for gig workers and um, so much of the industry is gig. Most of it is. Yeah. And um, so that, I think that level of education needs to be hammered in and normalized. Um, well, the pandemic's done some of that. I mean, I think that on a, on a broad scale, when you know when Broadway goes dark, and when you see like no, you know, there's no theaters open, no movies being being you know made or being um, released. Like, I think we've started to have that conversation in the last twelve months. That hey, there's a lot of people that are affected by this. It's not just the businesses, the small businesses that are closed because of, of restrictions. The whole entertainment field is has been put on pause. You know, and that, that, that's everybody. That's costume designers. That's makeup artists. Yeah. Um, that's actors. That's writers. Like if there's not a need for content, you know, none of us get to work. And how do we, you know, how do we pay our bills? How do we take care of our families? Um, I think this is helping us turn that corner. It's, it's sad that it's taken this kind of global pandemic to have that conversation. But I think it's, it's at least raising some awareness that it's not just, you know, when the, the studio is hurting, may not get a lot of sympathy. But when theaters close, you know, people start thinking, yeah, that's, I guess that does mean that even theater employees can't work. You know, like every sector of the entertainment industry gets hurt. Yeah. Um, well put. This is, uh, this has been my, I think this has been one of my favorite episodes in a long time. <laughs> I felt very natural having this. I really appreciated this conversation a lot. Um, I have this uh, April's National Poetry Month, so I'm featuring all writers from different genres, different mediums. So I was thinking about holding this over for that, so we can have screenwriting representation. And <laughs> I love it. That sounds like a great idea. So, um, yeah, I, I I felt like this was a good vibe, and um, didn't we 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 kind of have similar views on things. So, which is an impression I kind of got through Twitter as well. I've kind of I've kind of cleaned up my Twitter approach too because I, I I let some of my 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 fired up side folk take the focus for a while like during the election year and I mm. found myself it exhausted my energy. Yeah, I would feel like I would I would want to respond to things that were going on that I felt were wrong and 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 not that people shouldn't speak out but I, I felt for me personally it was interfering with my creative process. I'd rather put that energy into the things I'm writing rather right. than just always put it out to social media where you never know what kind of anger and hatred you're going to so solicit by making a post. But, um, but I, but I do like the platform of getting out the message that, Hey, I'm hustling and I'm just working hard to bring things to life. And I'm curious what you're bringing to life. And that's kind of the vibe I try to put out. Yeah. Same. Um, I think that's one of the reasons I've come and gone from Twitter so often is, at a certain point, it all for me at least, it always goes, it devolves into politics, and then so 
I'm like, oh, what if I just had it for the podcast? That doesn't help either because the podcast is me. And mm -hmm. so I just, you know, I try to focus on, on the other creatives on there as much as possible, retweet them, share their stuff. Um, and I'll continue to do so. Thanks, man. I really appreciate Thank you coming you. on here. This has been a blast. I appreciate you. All right. Bye. Yeah, bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for visiting my YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell notification.